I hope all of you well and happy. And thank you so much for joining the Q&A session. I hope by the Q&A session, you can get some knowledge about Dharma. Also, I hope you get some uh, clarification about your doubt. First, I really welcome all of you for the Q&A session. As usual, at the beginning of our session, this morning session, please everybody be physically, mentally relaxed. And do short time for the breathing meditation. <clears throat> First, you just breathe in until the, your throat feel the sensation. Breathe out, feel the sensation around your throat all the way to your nose. Second, please feel a feeling or sensation or, you know, uh, the feeling you need to feel the air or the breath going from your nose, throat, until around your heart. <clears throat> you need to feel the, you know, feeling or sensation. You need to feel the air is going in and out until your heart. Now, everybody, please breathe in as much as you can and hold the breath for quite a long time. <clears throat> and out very slowly. Once more in. And out. And fully breath out and stop, hold.
will relax. So while you are hold the breath in, <clears throat> then you can feel, you know, the the beeping of your heart. Also, your lung feel very agitated because the lungs cannot hold anymore. Then you, when you release the breath or oxygen, you breathe very gently, smoothly, slowly. And breathe in and out a few times. When you fully out, make sure your chest, your lungs, your stomach become very flat. Then you just stop. Don't breathe in and out as much as you can. In that moment, also you can feel that your lung is really, you know, really agitated, agitating. Your heart is really looking at uh, oxygen. At the same time, also you can feel your in in, in your head, the brains see looking at uh, oxygen. You look like you know, like really looking at uh, oxygen. So you do the exercise few times. Then again, you just breathe in. Feel the feeling of going air in your body from your nose, your throat, your lungs, all the way around your, you know, below the belly button, around the belly, and out, in, out. Then when I say you know, stop in, you fully breathe in all the way to your stomach. Then you hold the air or the oxygen in your belly. Hold as much as you can. Okay? and out from your belly. So next, you need to hold, okay? You breathe in as much as you can, completely full your lungs and heart, particularly around your belly. It's just, you know, full with the oxygen, your belly little bit come out, like a little, little ball. So you just hold as much as you can. Okay, stop. Once more, you breathe in and out after you fully breath out. Then you again, make sure there's no any kind of oxygen and air in your belly, in your lungs, in your heart. Hold your body become very flat. Or your upper body from your belly, everything become look like very flat. Okay, once more, breathe in.
out, 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 stop. Relax. Right? Now, this moment, do you have any kind of strong negative thoughts? Neither positive nor negative. Your mind becomes very neutral. Also, within your body, you feel quite a pleasant sensations. Because why? Because through your, your, our breathing exercise, all our four elements became balanced. Our, also, our, our, whole our body functioning also become very relaxed. Therefore, this moment you can feel very quiet, also very pleasant, because you don't have a neither negative nor positive. That means your mind become, you know, pure white clothes. A white cloth, very easy to change into different colors. Then after you have this kind of neutral mind, pleasant feeling, then next I will ask you to suddenly you can, you know, remember all sentient beings around you, particularly your enemy the person, the group of people, and cultivate compassion. And need to feel, need to see, you know, all kinds of suffering they have. We are not going to say we have, they have, because you need to cultivate compassion. Therefore, you need to see you know, all kinds of suffering they have. Also, we have, we have to see all sentient beings completely in suffer. Then you have a strong motivation or strong aspiration to them be happy, love, free them from suffering, compassion, right? Therefore, you need to know the point at the beginning why we need to do the breathing meditations. Because in order to calm your body and mind, in order to balance in your five, eight, four elements in your body. Otherwise, right, right at the beginning, if you try to practice compassion, love, try to do the meditation on, you know, compassion, love, emptiness, you cannot. Because your mind haven't calmed down. Your body is still very active. Therefore, this kind of breathing meditation is very, very important, number one. Number two, many people in Singapore, they used to live with a air conditioning. They always drink cold, drink like cold drink, eat cold food. Therefore, many people has a, you know, very uh, coldness feeling around your stomachs around your uh, kidneys, kidneys. So if you do the, the last, you know, the breathing meditation, breathe, breathe all the way to your stomach, hold there as much as you can, and release. And few times breathe in and out, fully release and hold. Is is very in, uh, useful technique to produce heat around your lower 
body, particularly around the stoma and around the kidneys area. And if you do more, you know, effective way to produce heat around your uh, belly, around your kidneys, around your the unitaries, unitaries, right? You need the urine, uh, the channels. Then after you fully breathe in, then you need to visualize very tiny, single, tiny object, very small object around your, below your belly. Then you just focus on the small, like bindi, small object below your belly button, around your pelvic parts. Just fully focus the small object and do few, you know, like maybe 20, 30 minute meditation on focus, the small object below your belly button, below, uh, let's say around your private parts. So there's a particular nerves, I'm not, not going to tell you, is really useful to produce heat around your uh, stomach, around kidneys, particularly in whole parts of our body. That's why this is the three kind of practice, the person who practice tummu. Because the heat starts from your, you know, around the belly. Then slowly this heat always go up. The whole your body feel very hot. Therefore, even though this day, you know, many practitioners, include lay person, they also do a tummu practice in order to keep their body warm. Because the practitioner who stay in like a Himalaya, who stay with a very simple little cross, they need a technique to produce heat themselves. So this is the uh, pre, you know, discussion with us, our discussion. Second, somebody asked a question, how we can, uh, one way we're talking about, you know, food offering. Yeah, food offering. Then the person asks, how to handle the food offering in puja and wastage? So one way we're talking about food offering, we offer so many, you know, kinds of food, like fruit and foods and cookie and biscuits. Also, in another hand, it looks like we, you know, wasting wasting the food. So it depends on the in, uh, uh, environment. For example, in Tibetan society, when we do so offering, so they always have a you know, few thousands, maybe a few hundred gathering. So after we offer the so offering food to you know, whoever, then we distribute the food to the people who attend, and attend the puja. At the beginning, we should not think is for distribution. We should not is, is, is mainly for distribute for the people. No. First, we think whatever we set up is mainly for offering. Offering to you know the fellow merit, offering to the sentient beings. At the end, that we should not waste, we share, distribute, we must eat. Second, in the Tibetan society, when you make a so offering, food offering in home, you know, we don't have uh, many people who come to your house, but we set a big amount of offering. So, then after complete the puja, so we bring the so to the, you know, all the family. Also people know it is a blessed food and they will eat. They will accept, they will, you know, happily accept and eat. In Singapore, 
we, we cannot bring the food, you know, to distribute to your neighbors. Therefore, when you make this offering, you must have a something to offer. But you should not set up big amount of offering because you cannot finish yourself. Also, nobody going to, you know, accept, no going to accept your offering. Therefore, in TBC, when we have a soul offering, we will offer something in the temple. We offer only, we keep there not more than three days. Why? Make sure the food is not going to be spoiled. After three days, then the best parts I keep. Then the rest of the fruits, cookie, whatever, sometimes I bring into plastic bag and I offer, give it to the people in the worker, like Indian, Bengali, like whoever, Malaysia, whoever. I always offer the things to the worker. And they are very happy to accept the, you know, uh, things. When we try to offer this to, you know, the local people, they are not, you know, willing to check. They say, no, 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 thank you. They just leave. Therefore, in your house, when you set up offerings, please set up, you know, where not big amount, maybe one big plate is enough. The second, when you make offering, and then, then the, the visualizing is very important. You know, you can visualize many offerings that offer to the field of merit. And also, many people think after we offer, we cannot eat. No, definitely, definitely it's okay to eat, you must eat. We believe this is the, the blessed food. And also another important, I can see, I think on the July, right, June or July, Singapore celebrate like a one month kind of celebration for offering food for the gods or, you know, being. Then most of the, every family, every shops, they, they put like a, um, a fruits, cake, or drink. <clears throat> then I know this just set up there for, you know, offering to the um, being. After that, nobody will take it. Nobody will eat it. It's quite big waste. If you follow, you know, this, that kind of tradition, if you believe, you know, that kind of tradition, you just offer very simple, you know, one piece of, fruit, maybe little small candle. Don't offer, you know, too much. It's really wasting food. Also, we have a culture to burn the paper. Someone pass away, you know, we buy, you know, like a lot of like, uh, paper with the painting, color, symbolic, so and so. We burn a lot of papers. This also, I don't know much about the practice. Also, it looks like, you know, quite big waste. Not just wasting the, you know, uh, papers. Also, it's really polluted the environment. So this thing, you know, according to the time, we need to change this kind of culture. Okay, this is the question for answer for the first question. Second, one of the, our Dharma friend asking the dream yoga is good or not. Or the person, they have been reading the books written by Wangyal Rinpoche. I personally, I really don't know him, but I knew him, I knew about him. He's uh, uh, one of the Tibetan uh, Rinpoche. He always teach, teaches the dream yoga. If you are not advanced practitioner, particularly if you are not advanced about to recognize, you know, uh, the subtle mind, then the dream yoga is not useful, not became very important. If you're able to recognize the subtle mind, if you're able to see the dream as a dream, 
during the dream timing, dream time, they useful. Most of us, after we woke up, in the morning, then we realize, oh, it was just dream. We cannot recognize the dream as a dream during the sleeping time. Therefore, when we have a wonderful dream, we feel so happy when we woke up. When we have a terrible dream, very scary dream, when we woke up, we feel scared. We feel very suspect about the dreaming because we didn't realize, we don't realize the dream as a dream in the sleeping time. So if you're able to recognize the dream as a dream during the dreaming time, then the dream yoga becomes very important because you can see yourself in the dream. And there's a lot of practices about the dream yoga. The dream yoga is linked with the, the Hindu Tantrayana and the Buddhist Tantrayana. It is very important or the useful as an ordinary, like a, you know, our Dharma friends, most of you, I don't think it can be very effective. It can be important for you because most of you really don't know anything. The best, you know, study Lamrim, practice Lamrim. Study the Tandra Sudrayana path. There's no any dangers. Also very easy practice. We talk about compassion, we have a compassion. We talk about generate compassion towards all sentient beings. So we have the compassion, you need to extend the compassion to towards all sentient beings. Also we talk about contentment. We also know how to contain. Then slowly we have to learn how to contain with every, you know, every samsaric things. And also, you know, we talk about renunciation. Also, we are quite renounce in with a certain path. Also, you need to learn how to renounce with a, every samsaric things. Therefore, you know, practicing Sudarayana is very, is very practical, is also very safe. Practicing Tandarayana, if you don't know, there's a lot of dangers. So as a beginner who don't have a, you know, the profound knowledge about Tandarayana, then the Dream Yoga, even though you cannot really practice, it cannot be that important. So this is the answer for one of the, our Dharma friends. Okay, so can I have a question? We can start the new question. Yes, uh, we can. Um, Geshila, I think, uh, but then you know, the first question about uh, the food offering in the puja, I'd like to unmute uh, Sister Lian Chu's mic. Uh, she have an add-on question pertaining to that. So mm -hmm. let me unmute her mic. Uh, okay, uh, Sister Lian Chu, your mic is unmuted. Geshila, oh, thank you for answering these questions. Mm -hmm. Actually, my question was more sp also to do with the practice of eating a bit of the biscuit and then throwing it away. Oh, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What is the symbolism of that? Because mm -hmm. uh, after you throw it away, you, you have to throw it away properly. And in, in our living lifestyle, we have to throw it into the rubbish, you know. So uh, I was always a little bit... Uh, <laughs> Puzzled by this practice. It's very, it's a very, uh, very practical question, because uh, according to Tibetan, you know, like Buddhist traditional, when we do puja, so we make a lot of thorma. In the Western country, even though in the Asian country like Singapore, after you complete the puja, where you going to throw the thorma? 
If you just throw in the dustbin, it's a really big waste. So therefore, in Tibetan Buddhist centers, sometimes we, when we have a torma, when we usually we bring to the ocean, the torma, and we offer to the fish, it's a kind of like cake, then the fish can eat it. Second, when we make a so offering, you know, after we, at the end, so everybody must eat the so, then collect the leftover. When we collect, you should not collect too much. Maybe just, you know, small piece of, like a biscuit, small piece of portion. Then, yes, it's okay to throw away, it's very small piece. And also, sometimes we think it is best. Yes, it's best for the human being, because human being is not going to eat the leftover soap. But it is become very important food. The non-physical sentient beings, like hungry ghosts, like other, you know, homeless, I'm not really, I'm not talking about the homeless germ who doesn't have a, a gross form. So they can receive the, the kind, of, uh, kind of the energy, kind of the, the fragrance, the smell, they can eat the, the formless part of the, you know, food and biscuit. It's, it looks like very quite wasteful human, actually is not wasting, it is useful for the, you know, hungry ghost, the spirit. Yes. What, what, what are we thinking when we are doing that mentally? Are we sharing our biscuit with the other beings at that time and that is why we throw it away because after that we don't eat it again what, what is yes. the symbolism behind it yes because uh the the, the leftover so we mainly offer to the non-transcendent dharma protector the worldly dharma protector the worldly protector also we offer the leftover so, you know, the bad spirit, not the, you know, the, the positive spirit, the negative spirit. So after they eat it, the, if human take the left, the, after the left, after they eat, if human is a kind of, uh, you can have a kind of negative the energy, negative consequences. That's why after you offer the leftover so, you cannot eat, you can throw away. And also you, uh, we must know the you know environment, like uh, like Tibet and like like Lada where I was born. Nothing cannot be waste. So after we finish the leftover so we bring out in the all the birds, the crows, the vulture can eat it. Also all the animals are going to eat it. There's nothing waste. But in Singapore, yes, I said just collect very little. You're not sharing, you are giving your, you know, your leftover food to the, you know, the negative spirit, the, uh, the non-transcendent, the worldly protector. Let them be satisfied. Then, that if we believe they're going to, usually they harm you, they're not going to harm you anymore. Yes. Okay. okay, that is what we are supposed to be thinking anyway. Yeah, okay. yeah. therefore, uh, at, at, at the end of the offering, there's uh, maybe uh, seven, six, seven stanza. You read all the sentence, this mention how to, how, what kind of thoughts we should have that moment. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Gishila. Next question, please. Thank you, Gashila. Um, Gashila, I'd like to unmute uh, a new student. Um, he's a teacher. So, uh, Ji Jun, he has three questions. So, let me unmute your mic. Okay, please ask the question one by one. First yeah, one question, by one. Answer, question answer okay. easy. So, um, yes, your mic is unmuted. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Yuri and I just arrived in Singapore. I'm still in quarantine. It doesn't matter. I'm a teacher and I just wanted to find out what is the best way to teach the uh, right mindfulness and the right effort to small children who are not Buddhist. They may be Muslim or Hindu or Christian. 
So without being religion, but what is the best way or the easiest or the correct way to teach the right mindfulness and the right effort in a classroom for children who are only 10 or 14 year old without too much, you know, dogmas and rules and what, what could you recommend that I do? Uh, thank you so much for asking this question. First, I will tell you a little bit uh, what's really going on this day in the, the Tibetan society. In the Tibetan society, guided by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, he, he categorizes Buddhism into three parts. Buddhist science, then Buddhist view, then Buddhist practice. The Buddhist science, the Buddhist view can be used, useful for every human beings. And the Buddhist practice is only for Buddhist, number one. Number two, due to the His Holiness you know, vision, His Holiness always talk about secular ethic. Ethic, secular ethic. That means you can be non-believer, you are a free thinker, still you can respect other religion, like I'm Buddhist. I'm pure Buddhist, I must respect other religions, other cultures. Look at, somehow this day, every human being facing mainly emotional problems or mental problems. Many human beings, they are, full, they are happy with the material things. They don't have a complaint about you know, food and clothes, they have a more than enough, but still, they feel something is lacking. So for them, we need to teach how to control our mind, particularly the negative side. So controlling negative sides is important for everybody, whether you are believer, non-believer, you are child, children, or you are adult, you are in all age, very important. So your question asking how we can teach the mindfulness Young child. child, yeah, child. Usually, it's very difficult to teach mindfulness for every human being in this moment, this timing, this time, because we there for one hour, we have uh, so many destructive destruction in thought in our, our mind because we have uh, so many things around us. Even though, look at. The phone is very simple phenomena, very little object. When you open, it gives you full of distractions. So since child, all the child, even though like three, four, five years old, they're using phone, they use iPod, iPad. They, while they're eating, they play the game. Actually, it's very difficult to teach mindfulness for generally, particularly also the children. The right methods to teach mindfulness without touching any religion. No need to mention dogma, religion, culture, nothing. For example, you can you put the number from one to 10 in your class, number one, number two, number three, one to 10. Then the children let them walk, you know, number by number, number one, well, when they say, okay, I'm in number one, second, oh, I'm in number two, I'm in number three, number four, number five, number 10. When they move their feet, let them realize I'm moving on the number four, next number five, 10. Then let them walk reverse, let them walk reversely, 10, next nine, Next, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Then the children can learn how to focus when they're active. 
this one. Then slowly you increase the number, one to 20. Okay, I'm moving number one. Stay there, stay there, remember number one. Move to number two, remember number two. Then let them move all the way to number 20 and reverse. Move 20, reverse. Then the children can learn how to focus, you know, in the present moment. Then slowly you can see, oh, the children become quite good on focus the number one to 20, 20 to one, then increase the number about 50, then 10, 50 to one, one to 50, you know, move back, forward, back and forth. Then second, you need to uh, switch the number, not order, okay, one, seven, six, you just uh, put the number randomly and let them walk. Where you are now? Number one. Remember you are number one. Next, which number you're going to step on? Look the number, number three, number 10, number 20, and reverse. This is, I think, uh, I, I feel is a good method to teach mindfulness, is kind of education. And also you, you, you can, you can, you know, put the, the map of the whole country, the whole world map in the classroom. You, have, you must have a big, you know, painting. And the children let them move. Oh, right now, where are you? I'm in Singapore. You are Singapore, I'm in Singapore. Next, Malaysia, then Thailand, Indonesia. Let them move, move, you know, country by country. Also getting knowledge, also, you know, uh, they are learning mindfulness because they need to remember the country name also need to remember which country behind in front left side and right side mm -hmm. this is the uh, you know i feel how to teach the mindfulness because in buddhism we say walking mindfulness lift up your feet move your feet touch to the ground move the second leap there's a many methods for the children. I think teach, through teaching by number, teaching by map can be useful. Okay, okay. thank you. Second question, please. Uh, well, I would actually, sorry, so maybe it's a bit personal. I will mm -hmm. jump to my third question that, you know, about the right action and the right conduct. And uh, my son is actually just told my daughter that he is gay. And mm -hmm. he, he's living with one partner. Mm -hmm. And does that count as sexual misconduct? And of course, I still love him. He is my son. And, uh, you know, I care about him, my daughter also. But what does the Buddhist teaching specifically about this kind of situation? I mean, I'm a father. I have mm -hmm. to show him compassion and love. Mm -hmm. uh, but does that really count as sexual misconduct if you live with somebody who is the same gender? Yeah. Again, thank you so much asking this question. Not only you, I think some of our Dharma, you know, brother and sister has, I think, same problem. Look at, we have to be honest. We have to be very open-minded. The Buddhism, nothing to do with whether you are gay or whether you are lesbian, whether you are rich and poor, you are white and black, nothing to do with, uh, you know, your partner. Nothing to do with uh, your kind of like a uh, wealthy or poor. The Buddhism is mainly about the mind training. Mind training. First, we must know Buddhism, nothing to do with the, the physical things. Nothing to do with uh, your life partner, your male and female, female and female, male and male. We cannot did it change this kind of, you know, culture and habits? I'm not considering this a miscon sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct means you it's okay to have a, you know, sex. Make sure the sex you can, must have a, you are the chosen partner. You are married, you have a wife, you have a husband, you always have a physical relationship with your partner. If your son choose you know, other boy to have his partner, it not, I'm not going to say sexual misconduct. 
but we have to know, we have to accept the fact that this way of having sexual is the not the natural way. It's bit again with the, you know, the natural way. It's not going to say mis sexual misconduct. Therefore, look at, as a father, you have the responsibility to take care of your children, your son. You, you, you have a you know, very strong love and compassion for him. Please don't worry about, you know, being, he, he's a, being a gay or not. Don't worry. Always look him as your son. Your son, part of your body. He carry your part of your, you know, like gene. Just always look him as your son. Should not look at him as a gay. It's okay. You, we should not say sexual misconduct, but it's a kind of, it's not the natural way to having the physical relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Third question, please. Does somebody else want to go or can I ask the next question? Uh, please finish your question. Oh, question three. Uh, I. Uh, wanted to know to avoid suffering you know avoid suffering of mm -hmm. beings. sometimes i try to become a vegetarian but sometimes it's difficult because you go to school party or somebody invites you and they they want to be very kind and they preparing a meal maybe chicken or beef and when you arrive is it compassionate to not eat and cause suffering but or is it you cause suffering because you're not eating the meal and you say, oh, sorry, I don't want to eat this. So is it compassion towards the animal or compassion to other human being? What, what do I do when that happens? Again, my answer for you, uh, the Buddhist practice, being a Buddhist, nothing to do with the word for you eat, what clothes you wear. You can be a very pure Buddhist being non-vegetarian. You can be pure Buddhist being a naked. Because wearing clothes is kind of culture. So therefore the Buddhist pact the Buddhism, the Buddhist practice is only mainly the mental training. You have to train your mind. So there's a culture to be vegetarian, particularly when you go in the, uh, like a, like a China, Taiwan, in Singapore, Malaysia, there many, you know, the Buddhist people always prefer to be vegetarian. This, this is, you know, their choice. When you go to Tibet, when you go to Sri Lanka, Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, Mongolia, Japan, Korea, most of the Buddhists are not vegetarian. It's up to you what kind of food you can eat. Let's say you are being, being vegetarian for many years. Why are you being, being vegetarian? Because I want to avoid suffering of the animals, suffering okay. of uh, 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 pigs and chickens. You still kill it and you cause a lot of suffering okay. for another. Mainly you want to avoid suffering for them, right? Yes. So this is a very good way to think, you know, being a vegetarian, I don't want to harm anybody, any sentient beings, like a chicken, you know, pig and buffalo, cow. It's, it looks like you, are, you want to practice the, the non-violence. Yes. Violence, compassionate. So let's say you are being vegetarian, somebody, you know, prepare non veg food for you. So that moment, that moment, whether you eat or you don't eat, the, the meat is already there. The being who already suffered, they already suffered. You not taking this meat, you cannot change the suffering. The being which already kill it, you cannot change. The sentient being already suffered, killed, the meat is there. So you should think this is already, you know, killed maybe a few days ago, a few weeks ago, it cannot change the suffering, already suffered. So that, that moment, you have a, you know, thing this way, you take the food 
and also generate compassion towards the being who kill it, who died. Or also you can just sense, have a sense of, you know, a sense of appreciate by people who prepare for you. You should not have any the negative thoughts. And also look at egg and chicken. I know chicken is a really, it's a living being. They kill the life, kill the life, chicken who has a life. Egg, still the big question. I think you have a more knowledge than me, how the egg generally transport into chicken, you know, within may maybe two weeks, few thousand egg transport into chicken, or the, the egg cannot be turned into chicken, they just be as a piece of egg. Yes, yeah. If it's not fertilized, Yes, it's yes, not yes. fertilized, then it's just egg. I think it's okay to eat eggs. Yeah, yeah. Fertilized, they use the lizard light, right? Yeah. Or the, with the rooster, yeah. Yeah, yeah rooster or the, the, the lizard light. Yeah. So, uh, so if somebody say, oh, I'm going to buy, you know, fresh chicken, please don't eat as a Buddhist, as a compassionate person like you. Also, in the many Singaporean, they always like to eat a fresh seafood. They are really directly killing. They are really you are giving suffering to the beings. We, we should not eat. Us order the fresh kind of seafood, fresh chicken or fresh like duck. Otherwise, I think for me, what I feel if buying meat from supermarket. I cannot see, you know, the point, not eat, not, not good to eat. Okay, so this is my answer for you. Thank you. And I thank you so much for really, you know, being a teacher. So teacher teach, you know, the modern education. At the same time, you, you are teaching with a lot of compassion. It's a really good action. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, please. Thank you, Rejoice. Uh, we'll move on to the next student. Uh, we have Sister Li Hua. Uh, Sister Li Hua had two questions. So let okay, me ask one you by one. Question. Yeah. Uh, Sister Hello, Yuan. good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Geshila. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is, if Prasangika says that everything is subjectively existent, then you you like everybody is also coming from your own mind is that how i should understand it then if i apply to myself then i as li hui also come from your mind but then i know that i exist regardless whether of your mind so so is this how i should understand it why do you think, according to Pasangeta, everything is subjective? The existence. That's what I thought I learned. <laughs> no. Is In that the not Pasangeta, right? They never say everything exists from subjectively, objectively. Thing exists merely imputation, impute, imputation. Here, I think, uh, I think it's important for everybody to no little bit. For example, before there's a piece of, you know, like a wood, the wood, tree, a piece, piece of wood wasn't a paper, a simple wood. Then due to the process, sim similarly, the piece of wood transformed into what? Paper. Yeah, let's say the paper is made of tree. So first time somebody, you know, transform the piece of wood into paper. First, they come piece of things, no paper. There's a wood through the process, the, the piece of wood, wood became something like flat, able to write. It, that time haven't become a paper yet. Something there. No name, 
Then somebody just give a name. This since this thing, paper, right? Now you can see how the the what sheet, the what piece become paper because of the our mental imputation. We have a thoughts that we name paper. The paper when you hear is a voice. Behind there's a thought to name as a paper the thing, I mean say thing. So according to the Pasangika, everything exists, be paper, be person, be books, whatever to be is mainly imputation. Being a paper, not from the object side. Objects are just piece of piece, just piece of things. Then we name paper. Like you are Li Hoi, right? Li Hoi. Why you are Li Hoi? Why not your other sister not Li Hoi? Hmm? Can you answer me? Don't no, know. Very simple. First, your mother, mom has a like a baby girl, right? The baby wasn't Li Hui, it's a baby girl. Then your mother or father or somebody named Li Hui, since the piece of things, the baby become Li Hui. If the baby be, be, be a Li, Li Hui from the object side, since you born, no need to give a name because you already born as a Li Hui. No, right? You just born as a baby girl, then somebody named Li Hui since the baby become Li Hui. Then whether they are Li Hui or not, it depends on the subject mind. Without mind, we difficult to say Li Hui is there. For example, right now we are in Singapore, right? Singapore. And this moment, if I ask you all of you, the Bodh Gaya Mahabodhi Stupa is exist right now? Is exist right now? I'm asking you a question. Yes. Everybody answer in your mind. Yes. How do you know the Bodh Gaya Temple exists this moment? How do you know? Uh, yes. If there you will be reported in the news how do you know all news what, what happened everything do you know today all no. the news is no, no right there are so news if some if you be honest somebody has said do you think the both guy are temporarily exist this moment this you saying i don't know maybe yes maybe not because you don't have the subjective subject you do you don't have a mind to prove Right? Therefore, yes. according to Pasangika, we can say everything exists because of the thoughts and the trend. Everything, be paper, books, whatever, is come from the subject side, not the object side. Yes. Your second question, please. Does it make a difference when we recite the mantra silently? Silently means we in the mind, or we have to say out the syllables either softly, only we can hear, or must be like the person next to you can hear. Does it make a difference? Yes. This one, well, how we say yes. If if there's okay, if the environment is okay, when you loud, you chant loudly. Mean you chant hear yourself. For example, when I chant money payment. Om Mani Pemi Hum, Om Mani Pemi Hum, Om Mani Pemi Hum, Om Mani Pemi Hum. At least loudly chant, at least you can hear yourself. Look at, if you chant in men, mentally in your mind, you are not really chanting the mantra, you are reflecting the mantra. You are reflecting the mantra. Mm. Om Mani Pemi Hum, right? You are not chanting. So we have uh, three doors body, speech, and mind. All our actions is act by verbally, mentally, 
or physically. So when we accumulate, accumulate three together or one by one, when we purify the negative karma, you purify both together or purify by one by one. So if you're able to chant loudly, then we believe we purify the negative karma which we accumulate through our verbal speech. Yes, it makes different. Okay. It makes different. But, but a few, you know, there's a many occasion when you do the recitation, you are not supposed to chant. You need to visualize the mantra, then you must uh, read the mantra in your mind. There's a you know, few you know, occasion. Generally, you must chant loudly. It doesn't mean not you know, make a noisy around, around you, okay? <laughs> okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you, uh, Sister Liva. We'll move on to uh, our next student, uh, Elaine. So Elaine have uh, two questions. Let me unmute her mic. Mm -hmm. Elaine, uh, yes. Good morning, Geshela. Good morning. And all. Uh, uh, this is my first question. Uh, before learning the Dharma, the Lamrin, usually what, whenever I buy food, I just offer it happily. Now, uh, being more mindful of the thoughts uh, process, I notice that what I buy seems to be my favorite food. <laughs> it seems to be more for self. So how do I transform these thoughts? No, no, no. It's an, uh, uh, why do you feel a bit, uh, bit uncomfortable to buy your favorite food? It's like, it's like, I think the food is good. I want to no, buy... No. It's, okay. it's okay to buy good food. You must buy your favorite food. Why do you feel bad about it? It's like, I put myself in front first before Buddha. Oh, no. No. So, this is a very good question again. And all the questions are very good. And also your question, look at. When you buy food, you are buying your favorite food. It's good for you. You like it, it's good for your body. But most important, before you eat, before you eat it, you offer it to the Buddha. Also, you are buying the favorite food to offer to Buddha. Because first you offer to Buddhas, then you eat it. Yes. So you, do, you should not think, I'm buying only for myself. You can think, I'm going to buy this Buddha for me and Buddha both, both together. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, have to look at Have to be very practical. Also must be uh, look at There's a so many misunderstanding about being Buddhist. People think uh, in Buddhism they talk about contentment. Then they thought, oh, I should not walk so hard. I should not walk for walk for long. I should not have a lot of money. I'm Buddhist. I must practice contentment. Is a wrong. Contentment. You must have a more than you must have a enough food, money, clothes, house. If you have an excessive excessive desire to have a so much that I must say you must practice contentment. Mm. You have a very little. If I ask you still, you practice contentment, it doesn't make sense. So buying good food, buying good clothes, nothing against with the you know, practice of Dharma. It's nothing against with the Dharma. You must you know, buy your favorite food, favorite clothes. Be okay. healthy. Okay. Okay, thank you. Keshela, my second question is, is there advantage for sea barrier and the Buddhist ritual of doing this, the sea barrier, like throw the ashes into the sea. Mm -hmm. So is there any advantage of doing that? Okay. Again, for, for everybody, she asked this question, you know, is, uh, is there any advantage or not, you know, sea barrier. This one, <clears throat> the Buddhism in Tibet, 
the Tibetan Buddhism, I always say I don't like, I personally, I don't like Tibetan Buddhism, Thai Buddhism, I don't like. The Buddhism in Tibet, it flourished from India. All Buddhism all over the world is originated from India, right? At the Buddha lifetime, the Hindu cultures, the Hinduism is a separate all over India. That time they are only Hinduism and Jain. There wasn't Muslim, wasn't Christian, wasn't just only Hindu and Jain. When you look at the Buddhist practice the, in the Buddhist believing system, some so many things have only come from Buddha thoughts, you know, discovered by his mind. Then they, he expressed to the disciples. There are so many things Buddha expressed, Buddha explained in the Sutra is connect with the Hindu cultures. Somebody is connect with the Hindus, Hinduism. For example, you know, uh, not taking garlic, taking garlic, eating garlic is supposed to be very bad, bad food. How? At the Buddha lifetime, the Judaism is just developed. First Judaism, then after 20 years, then Buddhism develops, start. Therefore, in India, they are told twins, religion, twins, which is Buddhism and Judaism. So Judaism is already, you know, spread all parts of the northern India, like Bihar, UP, around that area. According to Judaism, Jewish culture, eating gali is a, one of the worst. Therefore, when Buddha give a teaching, Buddha also said, you should not eat garlic because the culture is there. And your question asking, you know, the Berry Sea, according to Hindu tradition, the Ganga River, the Ganges River, you know, considers it is a very holy river. When you do the bathing, eliminate your negative karma. You become very pure. This is a Hindu belief. Also, after you die, if, you, if somebody buried your bones and ashes in the Ganges River, the person who passed away, you know, going to purify uh, negative karma. This is a Hindu culture. It's a Hindu, one of the Hindu's practice. Therefore, in the Buddhist tradition, also, you know, mention this, the water is pure as a Ganji water. Ganji water, pure, holy as a Ganji water. It doesn't mean actually, the Ganges River is very holy according to Buddhist tradition. It's a holy according to Hindu culture. Therefore, according to Hindu tradition, you know, the Berry Sea or Berry, like a Ganga is very important. And so slowly then, you know, Berry in the ocean is come the, uh, the culture because of the Ganges. Do you want to know why uh, Hindu consider Ganges very holy? Yes, thank you. Okay. Many, many years before, many years ago, there was a Hindu saint. He was practicing uh, the Hinduism for many years. Then he knew the Ganga, the lady like Ganga, the girl, the heavenly, you know, like a female god, was, he, he, he had, she was so beautiful one of the most beautiful lady. Then the saint, the Hindu practitioner, the saint wished to marry it with the Ganga. Therefore he was doing a lot of practice to see Ganga, to marry with the Ganga. So he, can, he cannot directly contact to the Ganga Devi, but he able to connect with the Shiva. Shiva. So he always prayed to Shiva, asking Shiva, and always annoying, you know, give me Ganga, give me Ganga. Then what happened? Then the Shiva asked to the Ganga's grandpa, please send her to the world. 
to the, the you know the to the sadhu then the gangas knew a human realm the world is so dirty very unclean she cannot come and stay in in the human realms also she cannot you know reject to his grandpa her grandpa then she said okay grandpa i will go to the human human realms on the planet but actually she thought i just said to her my grandpa i will go actually i will go to the nagaland nagap nagaland then he just left from the uh, heaven heaven and he just want to go to naga then she was notice she's go, she's not going to go to the you know human place human realms so she ran away and she was catch her and she, she put in the uh, she was here she has a she was a big head you know big hair so he just she was put her in the she was here within in the hair then gangas living there for many years then the hindu said still asking to shiva you know can i have the ganga then she shiva doesn't did he have any choice he just squeeze here his hair squeeze the hair squeeze then the water come from his hair the drop of water i think drop at the ganges river that means the devi ganga remain in the ganges river since the ganges river become holy this is a very hindu tradition as a buddhist doesn't matter after you pass away after someone pass away they can you know cremate the body they throw in the sea they bury in the ground in the buddhist culture it doesn't make any different after someone pass away the body is just piece of meat and bone and flesh it doesn't make any different to do you know sea bury sky bury cremation bury underground it's just piece of fish and flesh yes any yes. question yeah thank you geshela i get what you mean thank you okay. welcome okay uh thank you geshela mm -hmm. um okay uh maybe we would uh, get uh, sister zoe uh maybe i i mute your mic see uh what is your question okay mm -hmm. so zoe yes your mic Good morning, is unmuted everyone. Good morning. Can, you hear me? can you hear me yes can hear you Good. okay thank you good morning geshela good morning everyone geshela mm -hmm. would you please share with us about renunciation how do you contemplate on renunciation because for myself i find the most effective way to contemplate or on a daily basis to try to try to practice renunciation is to cultivate the mindfulness of death that means the my, the contemplation that death is certain that the time of death is uncertain and at at the point of death nothing helps except our spiritual practices but how do you do it how how do the uh, realize uh, beings start on in this journey thank okay. you kishla thank you so much asking this question about how to renounce how to practice the renunciations i said many time in lamrim class in english there is the renunciation and tibetan we call nge nge jung two words nge jung nge mean definitely nge mean definitely certainly nge jung mean overcome free from something that right? nge jung nge definitely certainly surely nge jung definitely overcome definitely need to overcome from where from samsara from cause of samsara therefore nge jung definitely overcome definitely need to overcome from samsara and cause of samsara this is meaning of renunciation right now you can feel it 
in english renunciation in the actual tibetan or sanskrit the renunciation is a different definitely overcome surely sincerely need to overcome from samsara or cause of samsara or suffering this is the renunciation and you are right when you contemplate about death impermanent death you feel there's nothing i can attach nothing really can you know protect you from samsara from lower realms so when you contemplate about impermanence and particularly death yes you you can have a part of renunciations but still you have a sense of attachment in the next life next life so you need to renounce about this life and next life finally whole samsara therefore what lama songa ba said in the uh three principal aspects realizing the human life is so difficult to achieve easy to lose so you need to contemplate that you know the difficult to achieve easy to lose and also the life cannot stop life is moving towards the end on moving towards death and at the end remember the death so look at you have a very pressure thing if you use it you can you can have a big benefits if you not going to use it it going to lose any time let's say you have a big piece of you know the rare diamond you know it's a very valuable object if you don't sell it you know somebody going to steal then you really put to effort to sell it to get the you know most important benefits so you always remember my life is look like that rare diamond if i'm not going to use it it going to uh what do we it going to loss any time uncertainty death is part of renunciation second what lama songa ba say there's a lendri milu khobe dumanam lendri milu the karma and the effect is there never false there's no falsity there's a karma there's a effect little karma little effect great karma has a great effect there's there's always you know what you call uh uh never deceive the system of cause and effect lendi me look away do first you think about karma and effect karma and effect there's no really deceiving then you need to think the suffering of the suffering in generally in samsara samsarik general sufferings therefore this life there's nothing i can attach i am going to die at the moment of death nothing can have except my good karma except my spiritual path after i death if i born into you know high realms rich family wealthy family successful family again you are in samsara therefore you need you need to learn non attachment in this life next life forever in samsara so yes you you are practicing part of the renunciation not really complete so therefore please you read uh, the stanza from the three aspect of the path right three aspect of the path i think lamzo namsu ya yeah. three principal of, of the path yeah okay so everybody you. must read you know the three three aspect of the path three principal of the path is a very important about bodhicitta renunciation emptiness thank you in a question thank you zoe uh we will move on to sister lian chu mm -hmm. okay uh your mic is unmuted yes sister go ahead uh Ishila, this is a follow up to renunciation practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Our daily practice consists of the three principal aspects of the path. Mm -hmm. Association, bodhicitta, and wisdom of emptiness. And we can meditate on that. But I have also understood that for renunciation practice, we should try to do self-retreat on our own, uh, try to increase the time for the retreat, whether it's a few days or a few hours, a few days, and later on, a few weeks, etc. We can slowly, gradually increase. Mm -hmm. can, you us, can you give us advice on how we should go about the self-retreat. This particular time with uh, COVID-19 is a good time for self-retreat because we cannot go out much, we cannot see people. We don't need to go to the mountain. We can be very quiet at home as well if nobody is visiting us and so on and so forth. So if you have um, some uh, helpful um, um, advice, on mm -hmm. how to structure our self-retreat. We can start first with a few hours, a few days, uh, and so on and so forth. But I find that this is a good time for us to do it. Thank you, Geshe-la. Uh Thank you so much for asking this question. Uh, look at, generally, in Buddhist tradition, we have our three mind trainings, ethical discipline mindfulness, wisdom, all practices we can include into three mind trainings. Within the three, equally important, without ethical discipline, you know, we won't have the good mindfulness practice, we won't have a good the wisdom practice. The ethical discipline is like wisdom, then mindfulness, the wisdom go more deeper level of understanding of the truth. So it is good to have a retreat, you know, like a like minimum like a four or five days, one week, if you could do maybe one month, particularly you said, you know, the during the COVID pandemic time is a good to be a stay retreat. Somehow whether you you want or you doesn't want, you don't want, still you have to stay in your house. You cannot go much out. It's good to do retreat. When we say retreat, in Tibetan language, in Tibetan words, we say tsam, bondiri, tsam, right? Bondiri. So when you're in the retreat, you have a bondiri, you have a bondiri, you, can, you cannot cross out, nobody can cro cannot cross in you are alone or you are with someone who always have boundary. This is what this called physical boundary. Physically, you cannot go out. Physically, nobody come in. So when you do retreat, not only physical boundary, you must have a mental boundary. Sum. You have a physical sum, mentally sum. Physically, you stay alone, nobody come in, you cannot go out. It's very easy to have a physical boundary, you know, physically it's some. Second, the most important, you need to mentally retreat. When you are alone in your home, in your room, or in the mountain, make sure physically you are away from the, you know, busyness, busy life, away from the society. If your mind is still busy with the samsari things, you living in your room, you miss the market, you miss the supermarket, you miss the coffee shop things, then you are not really in retreat. So in order to have the good retreat, you meet the physical boundary, the mental boundary. Physically, I'm not going out, nobody let in come. Mentally, since today, until I, ending my retreat, I always only meditate on renunciation, bodhicitta, emptiness, that kind of thing. not any negative thought, let it arise. If you have this kind of retreat, it's very effective, it's a very good to have the retreat. For example, last time we have a 10 days Yamendaga retreat. 
in the uh, somewhere uh, I remember, we have a 10 days retreat. So 10 days, all live together. Then you can feel everybody become very pure friends. Build a pure friendship. When you go out after 10 days, only 10 days, when you go out, you feel very uncomfortable, a lot of destruction. It disturbs your peace of mind. Because in the retreat, you always try to have the positive thoughts. So therefore, in the retreat, you must have a both boundary, the physical boundary and the mental boundary. Therefore, the uh, according to Tibetan tradition, Buddhist tradition, they say for the three months or three years, ten years, physically I'm not going out. None of them let him come except one or two my assistant. Assistant also can come in a certain boundary. They cannot really come in close to your bed. Physical mental also say since today until ending of my retreat. I not let anger arise. I not let attach ego arise. If you do this kind of practice, it's very important. You can feel the result. You can see the result very fast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, do is, is there any question? Maybe last. Yes. Uh, one last question. Uh, okay. we will have uh, Li Hua's uh, mic to be unmute. She will have her last question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yes, your mic uh, is uh, unmute. I would like to ask if all sentient beings have been our mothers. This is a logical statement based on what we have lived since we have lived since beginning of last time, or this is a reality. Mm -hmm. And if our loved one this lifetime, will we meet them again after this lifetime? Uh, because we make prayers. For example, to meet our guru lifetime after lifetime. Mm -hmm. So it's, it looks as if like we can meet the same, in inverted commas, right? The same being again yeah. and again. So does it apply to our loved one? Or they must want to meet us, then we will meet them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is not based on <clears throat> your wishing to meet again not only your karma, they must have a you know, collective karma. You and your mother in this lifetime. If there is a collective karma to meet together, definitely, you know, you will meet in next life. In order to cultivate compassion towards all sentient beings, it is not important whether we can meet again or not. It is not important how many times we meet you know, each other, how many times you and your mother meet each other, how many times your mother used to be your mom. It is not important. Most important for developing compassion, first you need to accept, you need to recognize your parents are very important. With Particularly, mother is very, 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 very important. So, one day I was, I think, walking in the, around the, uh, uh, the Klang, Klang Park. I saw a Muslim lady. She was pregnant. Okay, she, 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 the baby was, her stoma is quite high, maybe six, six, seven months pregnant. And she leading a child. She carries a child. Plus, she carry a big bag. Think about that, that, that moment, when, when I look at the mother, I feel so, you know, really, admire or really appreciate. She has a pregnant one baby in stoma, one baby on the shoulder, one baby is uh, she leading, also carry back. But she never feel, you know, difficult. Yes, sometimes she feel difficult, but she despite the difficulties, she have a very pure love and compassion towards the three children. 
So very often, you know, we really, you know, uh, forgetting how mu how much mother is very mother is very kind, very important. How much she suffered when we were in the mother womb. Also, you know, until we finish our study. So first, you must remember, recognize the kindness of our mother in this lifetime. Then same way, you just say all sentient beings are same as my mother. Then you have a compassion. Yes, for your answer for you, whether we meet or not, it depends on our collective karma, not just one karma. Definitely somehow, later or sooner after your mother pass away after you know, before mother or you pass away you know you will meet it somewhere sometime it's definitely sure some somewhere sometime we're going to meet again you're going to meet again okay thank you so much i think this is the last question right that's right Kishila. last question okay so uh, again i really appreciate and thank you so much all of you to attend the uh, uh, Sunday Q&A uh, session. Then uh, this morning, why, what I thought about uh, our daily, you know, life. Then I was having a coffee. <laughs> when I was having coffee, I have a thought. Oh, right now I'm having you know, the pure coffee. I just put the beans, I press the button, I have a fresh, real coffee. It takes time. Need to put a lot of effort. First, I need to plug the uh, wire, plug. Then I need to fill the water in the water tank. Then I need to clean the, the, ground, it, the ground container. Then I need to add the coffee. Lot of effort, right? It takes time. At the end, the coffee was much better and fresh. This is what our practice is supposed to be like that. It takes time. Need to put effort. If you be patient with the time, if you put, you know, serious effort, definitely the fresh result you can have, you can really feel enjoy with the pure dharma, number one. Number two, we have an instant coffee, instant noodle, instant vegetable. We have every instant, instant coffee, right? If you make coffee, if you make every day the, tradi <clears throat> the traditional coffee, you cannot. Sometimes you're too busy, sometimes you're too tired, sometimes there's no enough water, Sometimes there's no enough coffee beans. You cannot have a, you know, the good coffee every day due to certain condition. Sometimes, then we have to drink certain instant coffee, instant noodle. The instant coffee, the instant noodle is look like our temporal methods, how to be happy. The lasting, the ultimate happiness we wish to achieve, it takes time, need to put a lot of effort, definitely you can have. In between, we need, you know, instant happiness. Instant happiness. Instant coffee. So, you're on the bus, somebody show you, somebody, you know, shows, somebody shows you very angry face. Hmm. Look at the lady, very strange. Oh, look at the monk. Very strange person. Show angry face, then we get angry, then we feel very unhappy. That moment, there's no time to apply the traditional Dharma practice. You need the instant methods to reduce the unhappiness. Simple, you think, huh, I don't think I'm very strange. Or the person, you know, him or herself is very strange. I don't care. They feel relaxed, feel happy. Therefore, I, I think everybody try to achieve the ultimate happiness through the very traditional way. It takes time, need to put a lot of efforts. At the same time, we should, should not expect, we should not wait 
until have the lasting ultimate happiness in between we need instant happiness instant methods okay this is what i thought this morning about our class therefore everybody try to be happy for 24 hours 24 hours even though you know your mother your father your uncle your brother your best friend pass away this morning we, we accept the fact yes he or she is my one of the my dearest one pass away this is a part of life should not be feel so unhappy change your mental mind be relaxed be happy it doesn't mean you are happy about the person pass away accept the fact yes he or she pass away who are my dearest one but we cannot change the fact it is like that also there's no point to be very unhappy because it just make me misery so therefore try to be happy for 24 hours use the traditional methods or use the instant methods to be try to be happy then you feel happy for 24 hours so that's why i want to say at the end of the our session and thank you so much and have a happy Sunday. Thank you.